Well, if you've got your Bible, I want you to go with me to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, and we're going to continue in our message, or in our series of messages uh, on desperate households. And this morning we're talking about help. We're suffering from a bad case of the blends or from the blends. And Proverbs chapter 24 gives us a few words to address as it relates to that. Here's what the scripture says in chapter 24, book of Proverbs, verses 3 and 4. By wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. And by knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So here, here we go. Let's read that again. By wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. And by knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Have you ever noticed how not everything in life that you plan out goes exactly the way you plan it? Yeah. Wasn't too long ago that a guy went into a drugstore in Kentucky with the idea that he was going to rob the drugstore. He announced when he walked in, walked in that he was going to rob them and that uh, he had a gun and he pulled the gun so that uh, they could see it. And um, as he walked in and as he was announcing that, he pulled a hefty trash bag down over his head as a mask. The only thing is that he had failed to think about the fact that he had cut no eyes out for him to be able to see through the bag. And so in desperation and exasperation, he finally gave up and ran out and quit the whole thing. Some things just have a way of turning out in life a little different than maybe you expected them to turn out. And when it comes to this thing of marriage and the home, there is no question but what that is the case, and that is true for marriages. Nobody, nobody necessarily ever planned it to be like it did, or nobody ever intended for their marriage to fall apart and just sort of disintegrate in front of them, right in front of their eyes. Uh, but it does. And, and it has, and it is for some. And every day, hundreds and thousands of marriages in this country end in divorce. And while you didn't necessarily plan for that to happen, uh, while it's certainly not God's ideal, and it, it certainly breaks the heart of God for that to happen, it does happen, and it continues to happen every day. A little over 50% of the marriages that, that take place now uh, in this country, uh, end in divorce. One, a little over one uh, out of two marriages end in divorce. But I, I think what's interesting is that there is a new statistic that's actually on the horizon, and that might even be a little more alarming than that. And that is that 95% of those same people that are divorced actually eventually end up remarrying which translates into 5.2 million step families, which carried out to its greatest end translates into one child out of every 18 is a stepchild. The only problem with that is, if you look at the stats, 76% of them, of those that are remarrying and becoming step families, 76% of them are ending after five years. Now, I think that most of us can understand why that is. If you've ever been in it, you know what I'm talking about this morning. If you have children or nieces and nephews or you have others in your family that have gone through it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Most of us know that it is hard enough to start with one crazy man and one crazy woman and make them one flesh. I mean, most of us know what that's like. Just how hard it is for that to, to work together as God intended it to be. Most of us know what leaving and cleaving is like and how difficult that can be for one man and one woman to come together and join together as one flesh. But when you throw his kids, and her kids, and his ex, and her ex, and her in-laws, and his in-laws, and you throw all of that in the mix, 
on top of what they're gaining and getting in this new marriage, you know that, brother, you're going to have a mess somewhere on your hands. In fact, it's actually more like pure pandemonium in some cases. It's almost like total shock for some folks because once you get past that lust stage and you get past that, that, uh, that uh, sort of that mush and gust stage, you know, and you get into the reality of trying to blend all of those factors together, one of the things you begin to discover is how hard this is and how difficult this is because you're not actually doubling, you're tripling and quadrupling the number of people that are going to be in your business. And that's not easy. That is extremely hard. In fact, it's difficult because of a lot of different things. It's difficult because you're trying to connect with one another and you have a hard time doing that because you've got other people you've got to consider. It's difficult because when you start try when one or the other starts to apply discipline to a child, the other has to uh, confront that and deal with that. But then you also have to take into account how are they being disciplined with others, where they go for the other weekend and those kind of things. You have to deal with exes. You have to deal with money issues. You have to deal with acceptance, feelings of rejection. You have to deal with times and schedules and holidays and planning. And what they say is acceptable or what they say is not good. You have to work all that out with papers. You've got to figure out how you're going to raise the kid. I mean, you see how many problems you got just by joining together a blended family. It's a lot. And if you've ever been through it or if you're in it now, you know those challenges, and they are extremely difficult, and they're extremely hard, and it is truly a struggle. Whereas in the traditional family, you got all the normal problems that go along with two people becoming one. In the blended family, you got multiple people with multiple agendas, with multiple belief systems, trying to do what God designed to be done by one man and one woman that becomes one flesh. And the result is that that living life as a family is hard. It's not easy. In fact, most folks that are blended families are just coping. They're just trying to get through the day or just get through the week. In fact, there are times when you feel like you just want to scream out, I want out of this. I, I, I didn't know what I was signing up for. Get me off this train. I, I know when we uh, we started a, the church over in uh, the uh, Paulding County, years ago it was a younger group of people that were primarily moving to that community so the median age of our congregation and you're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds in this congregation you're talking about you're talking about uh, the median age was 31 years of age and and they didn't come 35 to 40 percent of that congregation were blended families and they didn't come with just one or two children you know what they came with they came with five and six children. I mean, I mean, they were just, they were coming in with multiple numbers of kids. And sometimes, talk about trying to devise a, design a ministry for them. I mean, because you'd have one here one Sunday, but then the next Sunday they wouldn't be there. Or they might be here this month, but then the next month you couldn't even hardly get a ministry design because you wanted to minister to them as a whole, but yet it was often difficult to. And I'm telling you, my experience has been in dealing with those folks is that they are just trying to figure out how to survive, how to deal with it because they got so many issues that they've got to deal with. Now, that may be you this morning, or it may be somebody you know. And so... What I want to try to do this morning is I, I want to, if you find yourself in that place or somebody that you know in that place, what I want to try to just, just encourage you to do is hang on. Just hang on. Because God can bless your blended family just as much as he can a traditional home. The only thing is you just need to make sure that you get back on track with God's standards, God's principles, God's ways. And if you do... God's going to bless your home just as much as he does anybody else's home. Now, the question I want to ask you this morning is, what is his way? If you'll go his way, what is his way? If you're trying to do right from what may have started wrong, what, how, what do you do? What are, the, what are the answers for you? How do you maximize your potential for God's blessing on your blended family? Well, I believe if you pare it down, 
And if you, if you really reduce it down to its minimum, I really think that we can do what the writer of the book of Proverbs says we can do in chapter 24, verse 3 and 4. Proverbs chapter 24 says Solomon speaks of, of what you might call the mortar of the marriage relationship. That is, that is, for a blended home, for a traditional home, whichever it is, this is sort of the mortar. This, these are the things that sort of hold it and make it strong and help you live according to the principles of God. He describes both the results and the requirements for building an intimate, close, godly home, a home that blesses the Lord and a home that's been blessed by the Lord. In graphic detail, he describes the results of the home that's built on the principles of God. For instance, notice in verse 3, he does say that it is built. And what's interesting is this, it's the, the word that's used there in the Hebrew is the same word that's used of Adam taking, uh, of, of God actually through Adam, taking the rib out of Adam and using that to create the female, the woman. So you have in Hebrew, you have ish, the Hebrew word for man or is ish, and then the Hebrew word for woman is isha. And so he took her from him and he created her, built her from him. And so that's what he says. He's in that, that's the same word he's using for the home. The superstructure of your home comes together as God builds that, as you and I uh, build that on the principles of God. And so it is a home that's built by God. Not only that, but he says it is a step by understanding, it is established. That I, that's the idea of it, it takes, it's set in order, it takes its place in this world. In other words, your house becomes a home, it's, it, it becomes established, set in place as God begins to build it and do what he does with his, with his word in your life, speaking that into your life. And then he says it is filled, by knowledge the rooms are filled, filled so you begin to live in your home and it becomes productive and it becomes prosperous and it, and you and you have satisfaction and blessing and so on it's filled with joy and love and so on as god builds that home so as you and i build our homes on the basis of the principles of the word of god he builds it he establishes it and he fills it and that's the kind of home you want that's the kind of marriage, that's the kind of family that you want. So he says, these are, these are the results of building your home on the Word of God. But then he says, there's some requirements. There are some fundamental tools that you've got to use if you're going to get these kind of results that he's talking about. So what I want us to do is, I want us to look, because he uses three words here. Three words. There's the word wisdom. There's the word understanding. And there's the word knowledge. So what I want to do is I want to take those words and I want to translate those into to what they mean for us in our world today, in a blended family, even for that matter, in a, in a traditional home. What do those words mean? How do they translate for us today? And, and I would say this, that if you're, if you're living in a blended family first, it's going to require perspective. Perspective. One of the hardest things to hang on to in a blended marriage, particularly where there's kids involved, is this concept or this principle of perspective. Everything is magnified once one relationship is severed and another is started. I mean, everything becomes magnified. Well, he's just doing that to get back at me. She's just doing that because she doesn't want me to have any money anymore, so she's just trying to get back at me. Or his kids are acting like that because they don't like me. They think there's a problem with me. they got issues with me because I took their daddy. And so on and on the list goes of all these things. It's just about how bad it is for us, how hard it is for us, how sorry those other good-for-nothing you-know-whats are. And while all of that may be true, that kind of thinking, that kind of attitude is not going to do one single good thing for your home today. So what you and I need to do with all of that junk that's going on in there is we need in our marriages sometimes to just keep some perspective. We need to see things in a different way. 
But now that's the value of wisdom because you know what wisdom is? You know what the book of Proverbs says? The book of Proverbs says, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore seek wisdom. And you know what wisdom is? Wisdom, it's, it's what you might call skillful living, but real wisdom is simply seeing things from God's perspective. Real wisdom, a really wise person, is going to be able to see things from the eyes of God. And when you see things through the eyes of God, I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, everything about your marriage will change. When you see things through the eyes of God, not your own selfish wants and desires, when you look through the eyes of God, everything, I don't care if it's a traditional home, a blended home, I don't care what it is, when you see everything through the eyes of God, you will change everything about your home. That's wisdom. For instance, one of the things I see most often in blended families is folks who, who really, they say to me, I'm telling you, I don't know how many times I've heard this. Preacher, I don't know what to do. Pastor, I just don't know what to do. I literally don't know what else to do. Because they know that whatever they do is going to be ridiculed. It's going to be criticized. It's going to be eaten up and chewed out by somebody in this long list of people that they now have to encounter. I remember reading Kay Atkins years ago. She wrote a book called I'm Not Your Kid. And the very first words in that book say this. Dear God, I don't know what to do. You know what? I've discovered that that's the way a lot of us walk around who are in the middle of trying to live in blended families. Men, and, and I'm telling you, I've, this is all stuff I've gone through. This is all stuff I've heard. This is all stuff. I, I've seen it. I've watched it. I mean, it's, it's great. Men will tell me all the time, I feel trapped. I feel like I'm stuck. And I'm stuck between a lot of different things. And they'll, they'll, they'll tell me, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I try to discipline her kids. I try to make sure I raise them the way I ought to raise them. And yet she gets mad at me. Or either the other parent gets mad at me. Or somebody else gets mad at me. And so they don't know what to do and they just grow in frustration. Women say the same thing. I feel trapped. They tell me, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. They try to encourage their kids to be with their real dad. So they want their kids to be with their real dad. And they want them to spend time with their real dad. And yet when they try to do that, the husband gets mad because he wants them to be with them. And so they're trying to live between this rock and a hard place. Do I make my present husband mad? Do I make the people over here who's real dad? Do I make them mad because they can't ever see him? What do I do? And they live in this constant consternation and this anxiety and this turmoil all the time. And they feel trapped. And eventually they say, I can't take it anymore. And they break. And every day you face decisions that you know is going to make somebody else mad. And you know it's going to cause somebody to get miffed. And unless you get God's perspective, Unless you start just seeing things the way God sees it and you seek to please him, don't worry about everybody else. You seek to please him, you're going to live your whole life trying to inch your way through this maze of one mad person after the next. You know what you got to do? Here's what you got to do. You got to get the eyes of God. You got to seek to please the will of God and the word of God. You got to seek to please God and let everybody else fall where they may. And that sounds hard and that sounds difficult, but that's how you live. Somebody says, well, where can I get that perspective from? Here you go. The Bible tells you. Where do I go to so sign up for a double dose of wisdom? James chapter 1 said, but if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and without reproach. You know what you got to do? You got to be on your face every day begging God to give you the wisdom to see this through. Ask every day, because God will give you wisdom just like he does grace, in abundance and generously, and at times when you need it the most. It's sort of like the serenity prayer. You remember some of you had to learn that before. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And if you want wisdom, you want to be able to be wise, and you want to be able to have perspective to see things as they really are, the way God sees them. You cry out to God, and you ask him every day.
to give you the wisdom to see it through, to see it from his place, to see it from his perspective. First, if you're dealing with or you're living in or you know those that are in a blended family, start with perspective, which comes from wisdom, comes from God. The second thing that's, that's helpful to you is patience. Now, I know that nobody wants to hear about patience. I mean, I know that that's one of those kind of things where, man, don't, you don't want to pray for patience because, man, God will give it to you. But, you know, you hear folks talk about people who are short-fused or they're quick-tempered. Well, patience is the opposite of being quick-tempered. It actually means to be long-fused. So if you're a patient person, you're a long-fused type of person. It's somebody who's got a high threshold for inconvenience. So you know what a good definition of patience is? It's the ability to be wronged. It's the ability to be inconvenienced. It's the ability to be hurt by somebody else without losing your composure, without retaliating in kind. You know how you can tell when somebody's really mature in their Christian faith? It's when they're offended by something. And yet they've got the ability to overlook it like, a wa like water on a duck's back. They're just going to let it run right off their backs. You know why? Because they're mature in their faith. And they know that it's not an issue of what somebody says or what they don't say, what they do or what they don't do. They don't worry about all those kind of petty little things at, at, this, at this level of living. You know what? They, got, they live at a higher level of living. And they just let that stuff just kind of roll off their back. That's somebody in a marriage relationship whose love is patient. Somebody who's patient. And you know what quality of character is going to help you more than just about any other in this building of a blended family? It's going to be patience. So listen carefully. Patience. Loving Christ-like patience. You know why this is so important? It's because patient love is going to help you keep moving forward instead of getting all bogged down in all the offenses and in all the hurts and in all the daily problems that keep coming your way from two blended families. Hurts and heartaches, feelings of rejection, feelings like you're the only one who's always given. Those things are as common as the day is long. And I don't know how many ladies I've heard over the years say this to me. It's just not fair. Come on, be honest. How many times if you've lived in it or you know somebody who is, how many times have you heard somebody say, it's just not fair. It's just not fair. I shouldn't have to go through this. We have to send his ex money every other month. And I don't even have enough money to go give me a hamburger. I don't even have enough to pay my bills. I don't even have enough to get a dress. I don't even have enough to get another pair of shoes. And I got to send her $300. I got to send her $500 every single month. And I don't have enough to even pay my bills. Pastor, it's just not fair. Here we are suffering. Here we are having to live in this house. Here we are having to drive around in this little old car. Here we are. We can't do any of the things we want to do because we're having to send her money every month and we don't have enough. I don't know how many men I've heard say, this just didn't right. Pastor, this just didn't right. Her kids won't respect me. They won't mind me. Because I'm not the daddy, and she won't say anything to them because she doesn't want to upset the other. She doesn't want to upset them, and so it just makes me mad. It's just not fair, Pastor. This, this just isn't right. Or maybe the wife says, all we're ever doing is adjusting our schedule to, to center around his kids, trying to get his kids and their schedules. And it always works for them, but it never works for us. Well, you know what you got to have? you got to have patience. You gotta have patience. You gotta be willing to wait some things out. Just let some things just roll off your back and just give God a chance to do what only God can do. Now, the key to getting that kind of loving patience in your life is understanding. If you want perspective, you need wisdom. If you want patience, you need some understanding. Solomon said, By by wisdom, a house is built. But by understanding, a house is actually established. It's set in place. It's strengthened. You've got to have some understanding. Understanding is the key to developing patience in your home. Listen to what 1 Peter chapter 3 said. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. He said, husbands, live with your wives. Now watch this. 
listen carefully. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, I don't think that just applies just for men. I think that means also women. Women, you need to understand the things that are going on with, with your husbands. You need to understand how they function, who they are, what's going on in their life. But also, men, you need to live with her in an understanding way. Understanding her. The number one reason we fly off the cuff and we add insult to injury is because we don't understand something. We don't understand somebody's feelings. We don't understand somebody's hurts. We don't understand somebody's perspective. In other words, when understanding takes place, that's when the real building materials of a marriage is going to be, begin to grow firm and grow strong. It takes understanding. For instance, when you and I really understand the social dynamics of what happens in blending families, you won't be nearly as quick to react and get so defensive when you, when you really understand the social dynamics. Think about it for just a minute with me. Think about, think about this. You're talking about new friends. You're talking about new neighborhoods maybe new schools, maybe new houses, maybe new families. Listen, just moving in a house with everybody doesn't make a house a home any more than a marriage license makes you a, a home or, or marriage. There, there are a lot of social dynamics that are involved. And if you'll give yourself to really trying to understand all those things that go into making that happen and all those things that, can, that are there that can confuse and cause heartache and cause difficulty, you're going to find out you won't nearly need to be as quick to anger because there's so much that goes into it. If, you're, if you understand the psychological dynamics, you won't get so upset. Divorce is like a death. Kids have got to cope with a loss just like you do. I mean, think about this with me. The only problem is, while you and me, we can sever the relationship, you can cut it off in your mind, you can cut it off in, in your head and in all of your psych, psychology and everything else, for your children, they can't make that man not their daddy. They can't make her not their mama. And they can't make her not be what she's, they can't. And, and, and when you and I step into the middle with good intentions, trying to be almost like a dad or almost like a mom to them, there are things that happen inside of a person that frustrate and are hard to deal with. Try to understand that. And if you understand that, it'll change your behavior, and you won't nearly be as aggravated and so upset and get so mad all the time. If you can just try to put yourself in their shoes, walk one single mile in their moccasin, and it'll change your life. So if you understand certain things, you understand the social dynamics, the psychological dynamics, the biological dynamics, the spiritual dynamics. Maybe you want to raise your new stepkids in church, serve the Lord to trust him and so on. But maybe for the last 8, 10, 12 years, they were never raised that way. And they're still not being raised that way. Every other weekend, they are as godless as the next reprobate is. And they're living in that. It's hard for one or the other to get so upset and so judgmental and so critical when, when they're coming from a different world. Especially if you've got this thing called joint custody, whatever that is, joint custody. I mean, taking a kid who lives Monday here, Tuesday here, Wednesday here, Thursday here, or this week on here and this week on here, whatever that bird is, try to put yourself in, in their shoes and see if, if you're as mad and angry as you stay most of the time. Patience. It just takes some patience. And patience is born out of understanding. And the one who gives us understanding is the God who gave us Jesus. Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, but don't lean on your own understanding. No, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and then he'll direct your paths. You know where understanding comes from? It comes from the God who gave you his son, who understands what it means to lose sometimes in order to win. And so if you want to deal with this thing of blended families, and you want to, you want to find some hope, for your family in this thing of a blended family. 
You're going to have to have perspective which comes from wisdom. You're going to have to have understanding or, or patience which comes from understanding. And then finally, you're going to have to have some power that comes from knowledge. He said it right here. By wisdom, a house is built. By understanding, it's established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Knowledge is power. If you don't believe that, you just look at some of these fruitcakes like you're, you know, you look at, you know, remember Bin Laden or Al Zawawi or whatever his name was or is. They use knowledge to hide out and to hurt and to destroy people's lives. Knowledge is power. And so Solomon says, by knowledge, the rooms of a home are going to be filled with all kinds of precious and pleasant riches. Knowledge empowers you to make things better in your home. It, it empowers you to make things more fruitful in your home. It, here's what knowledge is. It empowers you to do the right things even when you don't think you can. It empowers you to say the right things even when you don't think you can. Knowledge is power. I'm not talking about just any kind of knowledge. Because knowledge by itself just makes you prideful. I'm talking about knowledge of this book. Knowledge of the word of God. Knowledge of the principles of God. Now when you have that kind of knowledge. And you apply that. That knowledge can make a difference in your home. And it can make a, a difference in the things you do. And in the things you say. Those things not only will bless him. But they will bring blessing to your home. For instance. I believe there's some things that God wants us to know. That will help us add to. Make our house a home. If we'll. If we'll know these things, and apply these things. If we know them, knowledge, it's power. First, if you know this, it will help you. It's hard to live like that, but it's okay. Think about remodeling a house. If you've ever remodeled your house, you know it's going to take you longer than you planned, cost you more than you figured, it's going to get messier than you ever anticipated, and it's going to require a lot more determination than you ever expected. Yes, it is. Can I get a glory on that one? Yes. It, it's hard. It is hard to bring that kind of, of living together in the blended home. But I'll say this. It's okay just because it's hard. The second thing I would say is this. And I think if you know this, it will help you. As the kids get older... It will get easier. Now, it doesn't mean it all goes away as they get older. But as they get older, it does get easier. They begin to become the sum total of their own decisions. They begin to make decisions themselves. They begin to branch out and do their own things. And they don't require as much interaction between exes and outlaws and in-laws and all them other mean folks and you know what. So as the kids get older, know this, it does get easier. The third thing you can know that will help you and empower you is that you're always responsible for doing right no matter what anybody else does. Your wife may want to do the wrong thing. Your, your exes may want you to do the wrong thing. But just because they do the wrong thing doesn't mean you should. You're always responsible, and I'm always responsible for doing right no matter what anybody else does. Fourth, fifth, whatever it is. You need to know that no child should ever be a weapon against someone else. No child ever should be a weapon against someone else. Ladies and gentlemen, you're only showing your own character when you make your child a weapon to hurt somebody else. Grow up and be a mama and a daddy. Whatever the next is. No child should ever come between a husband and a wife. First and foremost, God brought you and her or you and him together to make one flesh. And no child is ever to be. A disruption or a break of that. That's the home that God called for. And sometimes they'll try you in a thousand different ways. But first and foremost, it is you and your husband or you and your wife that make that one flesh unit. And then remember this, and this will help you. Sometimes 
you may have to lose in order to ultimately win your child. What does that mean? That means sometimes it's not going to be fair. And sometimes you're not going to get the holidays that you want. And sometimes you're not going to get them on the weekends that you want. And sometimes you're not going to get to see them when you want. And sometimes some of them sorry son of a guns over there are going to say things about you that you shouldn't ever, a child should never hear. And all of those kind of things are going to happen. But sometimes you have to lose for the sake of the better good of that child so that ultimately you can win them in the future. The final thing you need to know and his power to you is that God is always in control. And though you feel like you're losing it sometimes, he's got this thing. Lean on him and trust him. And so these are some of the things that are going to help you in that blending of that home that you may be going through today or other people that you know of. And so in your, if, you're in the, if you're in the middle or if you're in the battle of the blends right now, just remember, number one, the time to start making that merge, the time that you've got to come together is now. Don't wait until you've gotten your say in or you're doing. No, you come together now and be one, not two. The method you want to follow is God's method. You can't keep relying on old patterns and practices that aren't working that you picked up in your first marriage. You can't go back to those things. No, they didn't work the first time. Don't try those again. Go to God and get the wisdom of God, the understanding that you need from God, and the knowledge that you need from God. And in that, you'll gain perspective, you'll gain patience, and you'll gain power. And then ultimately, listen carefully, the person to change is you. The person to change is you. It's not your ex. It's not your, your, your mate. It's not your stepchildren. Start with you. Yes, oh me. And if you're, if you're the step parent now, listen please. If you're the step parent now, start with you. Trust me. Your husband, your wife needs your support. They need to know that you're in their corner and they're not caught between a rock and a hard place. They need to know that you are for them while you may be against everything else that's going on. You are for them. And I know you may not understand all that's going on, but if you'll just try, just try to get perspective and wisdom. Try to be more patient and understanding. Act out of what you know is right under God. You'll have the power to make your house a home, and you will see the blessings of God on that home the way you wanted it to be in the first place. There's hope for blended families. Don't let Satan tell you anything else. There's hope for you. Be encouraged by that today. Let's stand for prayer. No one looking around. Every eye closed. Every eye closed. No one looking around. What I've learned over the course of 30 some years in ministry is this. That you can go in the smallest collection of folks and you can go in the largest collection. And there's always going to be somebody there who's either gone through this or they're going through it now. And so I don't know where you are in your own situation, your marriage, your home, but I can tell you this, there is hope for whatever situation you find yourself in. That, that's what this Bible is all about. That's what this book is all about. That's what Jesus is coming is all about. That's what his death, burial, and resurrection is all about, that there is hope, and there is absolutely nothing. Your, your adversary is going to come along, and he's going to try to accuse everybody and you He's going to try to make you think that it's hopeless and it's helpless. You've gotten yourself in a situation that you can't get out of, but yet you're going to find a way to just give up because you can't take it anymore. No, you hear me well. You hear this book well today. I'm telling you that there is absolutely no, no marriage, no hopeless situation. It may be on its deathbed,
But I'm telling you, the God of Jesus is specializing in resurrection stuff. And he can raise whatever you feel like is dead today. And so it may be, and you may feel like you are just drowning. This God will help you. This God will lead, lead you. This God will love you through it. But just try it his way. Maybe you're here and you've never given your heart to Christ. And maybe that's, that's really the problem. Maybe you have no personal relationship with Jesus. And so that's the issue. And so you're trying what's failed already once or twice before. You're trying to do the same thing. You haven't seen the fact that, that you're some of the problem. Because you don't even have a relationship with Jesus. And you're trying to just in your flesh build this thing called a home. And it's not going to happen. Because you're nowhere close to having a relationship with Jesus. No, you've got to get there first. And so whatever it is that's going on in your life today. My prayer is that you'll hear there is hope in Christ. He can make everything new again. Father God, you know the things we're going through. You know the things that our families are going through. And so it is my prayer today that you will provide the help and the hope that's needed among this congregation today. For those they may know, I pray that they would be an instrument of peace. I pray that they'd be an instrument of, of righteousness for those they may know. And a word of encouragement. They would speak a word of encouragement in people's lives. But God, I pray for this group today. And whatever it is that you want to do in, in our lives today, I pray that you begin with us. Start with us today, God. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed and every eye closed.